podcast is the sixth in our series of um, short looks at different stages of the process of evidence-informed public health. So and number six is about implementation. So we've been through um, defining the problem, uh, searching efficiently for the evidence, the research evidence that exists in relation to the problem, um, critically appraising that research evidence, uh, making a decision about um, how to bring that evidence together when it's perhaps conflicting, adapting it to the local context of your own community, uh, and now we're on the phase of implementing. How do you plan for and implementing the kind of um, uh, new interventions or stopping the intervention that, um, that, that you've decided to give up? In this phase, um, it's really important to think about uh, key stakeholders. Who needs to be involved in the development of the plan? And hope that hopefully the really key people have been involved since um, the very beginning of uh, defining the issue and through this discussion about the um, applicability and transferability and how to adopt it to the local context or your own community. But um, key stakeholders in the planning phase of uh, how you will implement this change, um, getting approval from appropriate leadership, um, identifying what factors are going to be facilitators and which factors are going to be barriers to the implementation of this program, and uh, thinking about how you can um, support the, the factors that will improve it and um, take away some of the factors that might impede the adaptation of this um, intervention. Um, it's really critical as well to create a project timeline and have some specific outcomes in mind, which is part of the evaluation phase. There have been a lot of implementation strategies um, that have been tried for public health practitioners. So when you think about the fact that um, before you can have an impact on a population as a result of some uh, change program, you actually have to get the health providers to change their behavior, do something different than they're used to, used to doing. And um, everyone tries as a first strategy policy change, and perhaps even legally that's um, required that people follow the policy, but I'm sure we've all experienced um, uh, being in a situation where the policy changes and there's some education about the policy change, um, some written documents about the policy change, but that has not ensured the healthcare practitioners actually change their behavior. Um, an incredible amount of great research has um, been collated through a group in Ottawa, a Cochrane um, review group called the Effective Practice and Organization of Care, and they've looked at hundreds, maybe thousands of studies that um, have uh, tried to study how to influence the behavior of healthcare professionals. Um, very little of this research has been done in public health. I think. We've identified 12. Um, there may be more, but not much more. Um, so it's mostly with physicians in hospitals, some nurses, physios, nutritionists. Um, uh, so as I talk about some of this research, it may be um, useful for you to keep that in mind. Not much has been tried in public health. Jeremy Grimshaw and his group with the Cochrane uh, Review Group have actually done a review of reviews. So they've taken all of the systematic reviews that exist about this um, area and have tried to say, as a synthesis, what do we now know about changing healthcare practitioner behavior broadly? And the simple answer is that every strategy has some impact. Um, every strategy can work, um, has been shown to work, but no strategy has been shown to work in every situation. So different contexts um, definitely have an impact on whether or not these strategies work. So, the primary strategy that we've all grown up with is education, and uh, education as a change strategy is not very effective in the kind of continuing education credits situation where you go to a conference and you sit in a lecture and you get excited about some intervention, but it doesn't go any farther. Um, very has very little impact on behavior change. Uh, what has an impact on behavior change is a much more intensive focused, um, interactive style of educational format that actually um, leads to much better uh, outcomes in terms of changing the behavior of healthcare practitioners. Simple things like reminders um, in patient interactions or one-on-one -on -one client interactions or even in small group interactions, um, reminders that are on the file, you know, ask this person if they smoke, 
offer them the online uh, smoking cessation program. Those kinds of reminders um, do work in some situations. Financial incentives. It's been interesting to see that the financial incentives either uh, giving money to healthcare pro professionals who do and do follow an intervention, or taking away money if they don't follow an intervention, doesn't have much impact until the amount of money gets to be fairly large, it's fairly significant for that person. Patient interventions, actually interventions for hand washing in the hospital where the patients, uh, the staff will have to wear a tag that says, ask me if I wash my hands, has had an impact in some situations where patients actually do ask the staff on a regular basis and has an impact on staff hand washing and um, infection rates in those hospitals. Um, it's harder to think about how you might um, implement that in a public health setting. Um, opinion leaders have been an interesting strategy, again, that it worked in some situations and not in others, but going into a, a unit and saying, if you, had a, if you had a question about what to do with this client or this population, or what you should do in this situation, who would you go to? And then um, adding up all of the uh, points to see which name comes up the most frequently, then doing an intensive intervention with that particular person to say, um, uh, this is the change in practice that should be happening. And when you change the practice of the opinion leader, it spreads to the rest of the group fairly quickly. Um, again, there have been instances where it's worked very effectively and where it hasn't had an impact at all. Another strategy is called audit and feedback. Um, that is where someone's actually reviewing any written documentation to say, how are you doing or how's your health unit doing in relation to um, other regional health authorities, uh, are you above or below, and particularly where the audit comes back that you are below, um, it's had an impact on improving uh, the, the charting, at least, of that, uh, uh, the documentation um, that that intervention, it, that change has happened. Champions are really important, and champions are, are more likely to not, not to be the opinion leader, not to be the practice person, but more likely to be at a higher level in the organization, of uh, somebody who can push the, the board of health um, or any larger political group to say this is a really important intervention for our community and uh, we really want to um, get your support for this. Knowledge brokers are a fairly new but rapidly growing idea. Knowledge, the idea is that a knowledge broker is someone who has the relevant practice experience, so somebody who knows public health, somebody who knows your community, uh, and also has the ability to read and interpret the research. So that person can keep up with the most recent research and go to your group and say in five minutes or less, this is a good study, this is why it's a good study, this is why we should consider it, these are the implications for our own region, for why um, why we should or should not be doing this kind of intervention. So somebody who can really help with interpretation of their search in a way that's uh, meaningful to your own group. So knowledge brokers can help with um, translation and interpretation of research to uh, people working um, in public health programs to help make decisions about um, the utilization of research, the implementation of research. Uh, probably most effectively the interpretation of the research. So um, many public health practitioners may not know, for example, if a study shows an odds ratio of 3.03 in the confidence interval from 2.5 to 6.2. Is this a good intervention? Is this a good result? How do you put into words what this odds ratio and confidence interval is, is telling you? And is it clinically meaningful? Is it something that really is statistically significant and could be clinically meaningful. A knowledge broker really has the knowledge of the actual practical um, frontline workers and uh, how things work in public health and the understanding of research to be able to bring those fields together. So just to, um, if you want to find, find out more about any of this research, the, really the Cochrane Review Group uh, with Jeremy Grimshaw's group at the University of Ottawa called the Effective Practice and Organization of Care is a great site to go to, to get um, ideas for how some of these um, interventions work to help healthcare professionals change their behavior. But with the caution, again, that not too much of this has been done in public health, but it will give you some ideas for 
how you might um, uh, proceed with doing that in your own regional health authority. Just the other issue about implementing a change in public health practice is beyond changing the healthcare practitioner's be behavior, how do you develop the plan for rolling that out? And uh, John Labus has done some work with the Institute of Work and Health, and you'll find that uh, information on our Registry of Methods and Tools on our website. Um, he has what look like um, five fairly simple questions, but, but he has um, shown that if you can answer these questions, you will have gone a long way to the development of a plan. So questions are, what's the message? What are you really trying to get across to the, um, the practitioners where you work or the community at large? Um, who is the audience? So defining which message goes to which audience and who is the messenger. So who's the best, most credible um, messenger to get this information to the target group that you're trying to reach? How? how what's the transfer method for this message? So is it going to be in a public broadcast, a wiki, um, a public meeting, a joint planning day with um, your own regional health authority? So how is this message going to be transferred? And then, what's the expected impact? So the expected impact brings you to how you evaluate it. Not only how you evaluate the change in practice, but what, what, what's the evaluation for this change in programming that will let you know a few years from now, was this a good decision or was it not, or does it need to be tweaked in some way? So I, again, if you go to our Registry of Methods and Tools, you'll find uh, this tool by John Labus, um, and you'll find uh, quite a bit of information about um, in, various implementation strategies, strategies that have been tried and, and how they've worked and tools that are available for you to use. Um, and then you can go on to the last of this series of webcasts which is about evaluation.